Okay, let's get started here. Um, I wanted to, is this one? Okay, sometimes I need this. So um, I wanted to just thank you for inviting me here to uh, talk about my work. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's a really great opportunity to talk about uh, my book that has just come out, or came out in late 2011, and um, some new work that I've completed and that I'm working on. So special thanks to, to the director, Mike, Mark Seidel, and also Mike, Mark Knoyer, who um, began uh, with my invitation, uh, Rachel, Lalita, everyone else, uh, Sam, who helped me uh, with various aspects of coming here. So what I'm gonna do today is um, draw on some uh, insights from my book, which came out, like I said, in late 2011, called Militant Publics in India. And what I'm gonna do is present a rough outline of, well, it's not a rough outline, it's, it's the outline, because it's done, uh, of the entire book. And then I'm gonna explore one particular aspect that I uh, discuss, specifically the uh, importance of war and military training, which Gandhi experimented with um, in South Africa, in South Africa, particularly with the uh, Indian diaspora there. Now before I start my uh, uh, talk, I just want to mention um, my next book project that I'm writing right now. It's a transnational history of urban consumption in Ahmedabad and Karachi. And I'm looking at the relationship between urban consumption and models of infrastructure development from the United States, Europe, and Japan between 1950 and 1980. So the story that I'm hoping, uh, that I'm right now uh, writing up and uh, aiming toward completing is uh, between 1951 and 1965, American and European urban planners undertook various planning projects in Ahmedabad and Karachi. So these are two business cities in India and Pakistan, as everyone knows which stressed uh, designing infrastructure development according to a scientifically uh, produced master plan. Strikingly, the creation of urban marketplaces played a significant role in the ascendant American model for Indian and Pakistani cities once placed in the hands of Indian and Pakistani planners. Enabled by these master plans of the cities in the 1970s, Bazaars, marketplaces, and commercial zones formed important nodes of the city's spatial and economic growth, located as they were along uh, both cities growing what they called the road system. Especially from the 1970s onward, a combine of builders and traders flagrantly overran the zoning boundaries of commercial roads and marketplaces and built illegal shop, shops and commercial centers trading in an unlikely grouping of commodities. So they included dry goods, food vending, um, leather goods, underwear, and stationery. <clears throat> um, and th these were vended along uh, shops located on road zones purely for residential activity. So overall, this project is going to, um, it underscores the role of commerce in post-colonial urban planning in both cities, which, is, which offers a rich history of uh, urban design and consumption in India and Pakistan. But what I'm also hoping is that it illuminates our understanding of urban consumption as a part of the, the development of capitalism in South Asia. So that's just, in some ways, the nub of the next project. This is a, a photo of one of these commercial roads uh, in Ahmedabad. So let me talk a little bit about the, the book now. So as probably a lot of you know, over the last four decades, brutal episodes of ethnic cleansing of the minority Muslim community have been undertaken by activists of the Hindu nationalist movement in the state of Gujarat. These attacks have been supported by the Hindu nationalist party, the BJP, which controls the state and is broadly supported by many Gujarati Hindus. Human rights organizations and secular NGOs have documented the growth of the movement and the important role that it's played by neighborhood shakas, right? local branches um, in which uh, young men and women undertake uh, physical training and various kinds of athletic games. So some of the primary sources indicate, this is quite well known, that a lot of the activists who participated in the violence against Muslims were members of these 
um, shakas. Accounting for the vast support of the movement among many Hindus within Gujarat and many parts of India, branches have been the principal sites in which young Hindu men and women um, meet at various times of day, uh, various times of the day, varying in groups of 10 to 50, in order re to receive physical training consisting of drilled calisthenics and games, <coughs> which are valorized by the branch shikshaks, the teachers, as quote unquote ancient martial rituals of Vedic origin, which only the most privileged Hindus are permitted to observe. Scholars of Hindu nationalism. Um, identify this particular strategy of popular mobilization in which physical culture plays a significant role as a unique strategy of the BJP to gain state power. Both the organization of branches and the orchestration of violence against minorities serve to nurture Hindu nationalist sentiment and therefore the support of Hindu nationalist organizations by polarizing the electorate along which religious lines which has yielded significant electoral dividends for the BJP. So here we have a picture of um, L.K. Advani in his famous Ratyatra. This is in some ways our first occasion to bring in Narendra Modi. This yatra was modeled on the annual Jagannath Ratyatra. I, I'm writing an article about that right now. It should be coming out in the new year. And uh, the, in some ways in the 1980s that yatra was transformed from being a kind of pan-communal uh, festival to being a vehicle to uh, uh, basically uh, instigate violence prior to elections usually um, against Muslims. Now that um, laboratory for the Yatra was then projected onto a grand scale and um, uh, Narendra Modi has been the architect of both Yatras since the 1980s. The, the annual Yatra and then the Advani's Yatra in the 1990s, which went from um, uh, uh, Western Gujarat, from Somna, to Ayodhya. <coughs> Historians of South Asia, as well as anthropologists and sociologists, comment on the paradox of the state of Gujarat, remarking that the very state from which Mohandas Gandhi's uh, nonviolent anti-colonial movement originated in the early 20th century has become one of post-colonial India's premier regions of religious violence and nationalism. It appears as if the rhetoric and methods of popular mobilization of Hindu nationalists in which physical culture and discipline pay, play a powerful role stand in stark contrast to popular recollections of Gandhi's call for the pursuit of a non-violent life, social and political tolerance, and peaceful coexistence with Indian minorities. The widespread support of militant Hindu nationalism in the heartland from which Gandhi's nonviolent movement originated causes us to ask if the role ascribed to physical culture and discipline and violence in popular politics has arisen only in the context of Hindu nationalism or does it possess a longer history that is um, not currently known. More specifically, was Gandhi's movement a purely anti-violent movement? And one of the arguments I make in the book is that it's not. I'll demonstrate why. Or does a closer examination of the movement reveal militant undercurrents um, within it? So these are some of the, the main questions that I ask in the book. And one of the things that I argue is that certain practices of physical culture and discipline that scholars associate uh, with Hindu nationalism were indeed indispensable to the creation of Gandhi's nonviolent movement. In contrast to previous histories that view practices of physical culture as emblematic only of Hindu nationalism, I suggest that Gandhi prescribed techniques of physical culture as both a set of ethical practices that would create moral uh, activists and as a strategy <coughs> to build a disciplined Satyagraha movement. Uh, especially one that adhered to his nonviolent strictures. Second, I illustrate how Gandhi embraced forms of physical preparation in the form of military drills, specifically, in order to build a popular nonviolent movement that could efficaciously undertake anti colonial protest. I examine how such forms of drill unfolded in the celebrated and first fully nonviolent Satyagraha 
which took place in Bardoli in 1928 in Gujarat. And I also demonstrate how popular politics in the early 1940s in Gujarat witnessed the introduction of subtle forms of violence into the nonviolent movement, specifically the Quit India movement of 1942. As Gandhi became more of a figurehead of the movement and more militant leaders, specifically Sardar Patel, gained effective control of it. In particular, I describe how physically trained activists were incorporated into the movement under the leadership of more militant leaders and how they blended together the, the disciplined tactics of nonviolent protests and more violent ones. So this is kind of an interesting event for me to just kind of ad-lib about. So the, and this is very much where I would historically situate people like Elke and Vani and, and Modi. The 1942 Quit India movement, the pretext for it was basically that um, people like Patel, Patel and Gandhi objected to the British using the Indian Army for the Second World War. So um, one of the things that Patel tried to do was he tried to offer the assistance of the Congress rank and file in exchange for in, in India's immediate independence. Now the, the British declined this offer and so the counter move to that was basically to start the Quit India movement. And this was technically a non-cooperation movement, but it brought in um, new kinds of activists that uh, undertook various forms of violence. Mm -hmm. Usually the, the model was there were non-violent processions happening throughout the city, and then flanking um, these non-violent satyagrahis were, um, the, the, uh, uh, were activists who were carrying arms. And they would usually bring out brick bags and latis and fight the police. Now these particular activists were drawn from the Socialist Party. And after independence, um, the members of the Socialist Party who were very disgruntled with the fact that the Congress Party was the dominant uh, power both in Gujarat and at the national level, they were um, drawn towards the RSS. And so it, it was those specific um, leaders who actually form the Jansang in Gujarat, right? So um, these particular leaders are the ones who recruited Narendra Modi and LK Advani. So this is, you know, we're talking about the 1940s, 1950s. This is where, um, this is in some ways the, the location of Narendra Modi and LK Advani. So the process by which non, uh, the nonviolent movement was built and it came to accommodate more militant elements in the 1930 to 1942 period was certainly a contingent process, right? But that's something that is discussed and, and reflected in the book. And my argument as a whole in the book contributes to the historiography on modern South Asia by demonstrating that it, there exists both continuities and differences between the nonviolent movement and the contemporary Hindu, and contemporary Hindu nationalism. In emphasizing the role of physical culture, discipline, and militant, militancy during different phases of, the, of Gandhi's movement, my objective is to stress how the Gandhian project was multivalent and how it articulated a vision of popular politics that varied significantly in the 1915 to 1942 period. Mm -hmm. So I don't mean to imply that the resonance of physical culture and discipline in the nonviolent movement explains violence in contemporary Gujarat per se but rather the persistence of forms of physical culture and discipline point to the deeper complexity of the Gandhian project on one hand and some of the unexpected roots of uh, contemporary polit political practice in Gujarat. Um, now, one of the things that the book also does is I was able to um, interview a lot of older activists from the RSS from the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, and um, contemporary activists in the VHP. Um, the, some of you have mentioned uh, that you've already read my work, so I won't go over that, those oral histories and that ethnographic dimension. But that is um, also something I discuss in the book to flesh out in some ways some of the differences between leaders like Patel, who were more militant, but still quite Gandhian in their uh, induction to nationalist politics and then the rise of Hindu nationalism itself, which is very much where uh, we can see, it's a story of 
Narendra Modi and these, these kinds of leaders, but as well as activists at the grassroots level who contest these kinds of leadership, which leads to very vibrant um, uh, kind of internationalism in Gujarat. I can talk about that in the Q&A if you'd like, but I just want to gesture towards that. Um, one thing I want to discuss in the, in the time remaining for my lecture is, as I mentioned at the outset, um, the themes of uh, war uh, within, the, uh, within Gandhi's movements, specifically when he's in South Africa. So Satyagraha, or soul force, is probably one of the most iconic concepts that is associated with Mohandas Gandhi and his a commitment to ahimsa, or nonviolence. In one of Gandhi's most well-read publication, Hind Swaraj, he characterizes soul force as a ubiquitous mode by which humans not only acknowledge the reciprocity that undergirds their mutual survival, but also mediated conflict. Soul force was central to political resistance in, Gan in the Gandhian idiom because it was arrived at when individuals secure justice through suffering. Gandhi distinguished resistance that was animated by the use of nonviolent soul force rather than by the use of arms, and this, this distinction has been seminal to interpretation of Gandhi's writing on Satyagraha as a method of political resistance as well as a metaphysical project. Though Gandhi was adamant about the moral virtue and efficacy of deploying love over body force to win one's adversaries, what I'm going to argue in the remainder of my talk today is that this particular facet of the logic of Satyagraha, particularly as Gandhi derived it in South Africa, entails subtle genealogical connections to military practices in war. As I will demonstrate, Gandhi was convinced that the emergence of a cowardly, physically weak, and emasculated Hindu male subject significantly enabled British colonization of India. I suggest that Gandhi estimated that Indian men would be able to deploy anti-colonial soul force, and especially bear the violence of the state that often followed once their masculinity had been restored. Therefore, he strongly encouraged members of the Indian diaspora in South Africa, especially free Indians from the merchant communities, to serve in the British Army and gain experience on the war front during two events I'll talk about briefly, the Anglo-Boer War in 1899 to 1902, and the Zulu Rebellion in 1906. Through an analysis of, the, as of these two sites, I explain how Gandhi construed military service, which took the form of the Indian Ambulance Corps and the Indian Stretcher Bearer Corps, as a set of transformative experiences that would enable the members of the Corps to endure several, severe physical duress and therefore acquire bodily strength in addition to, the no in addition to knowledge and the use of arms. As I illustrate, this experience and form of knowledge would ultimately generate uh, an Indian subject by transforming him into an agent who possessed mastery over his bodily senses, who had moral fortitude, and more, most important, fearlessness. Three virtues that were central to his vision of Indian masculinity in this period of his intellectual thinking. For Gandhi, the creation of the masculine male would demonstrate to both the Indian nation and the Brit the British uh, and the British that Indian men could indeed face death with unwavering courage. And when put to the test, they were indeed physically robust. The physically able and ethical Indian male embodied political freedom for India and possessed the true bearing of the agent who possessed Swaraj for self rule. So, one of the things I I'd like to be clear about is that in this period, of Gandhi's uh, development that, uh, in South Africa, I'm not trying to suggest that it reveals Gandhi's you know, brief sojourn into uh, an endorsement for political violence. Instead, what I'm trying to demonstrate is how his experience as a member of the diaspora afforded him with an opportunity to chart a method for the Indian male to recover from a state of supposed effeminacy and cowardliness for which military practices and its regimented organization were indispensable. During the period of his life in South Africa, Gandhi was removed from his social circle and his own perceived cowardice, and it afforded him with an opportunity to reflect on the inadequacies of the Indian male 
and acts, it provided him with access to a social and political field in which to undertake measures to address the perceived short shortcomings of the Indian man. Scholarly discussions of Gandhi's attempt to address the issue of the effeminate, effeminate Indian male underscore how the rhetoric of emasculation spurred Gandhi to devise methods to overcome it, particularly in the form of tabasya or self-suffering. So the Rudolphs, Suzanne and Lloyd Rudolph, they have an important study of Gandhi which indicates that his internalization of the British colonists' low opinion of educated, high caste Hindus, um, whom the British called feminine, effete, or unathletic, who were unlike the, the martial races, martial races of course, Kshatriyas, Muslims, Rajput, Sikhs, and tribal communities. So the Rudolph suggests that in India, Gandhi grudgingly accepted these characteriz characterizations to such an extent that he desperately lacked the self-confidence to be a successful lawyer or an assertive political leader. But in South Africa, he was able to recover his agency um, as a, a quiet and inwardly focused social thinker who pieced together elements of his program of um, nonviolent satyagraha through int introspection and uh, experimentations with self-control and deprivation. So as much as self-suffering was seminal to Gandhi's intellectual evolution in South Africa, what I want to draw our attention to is this young Gandhi, a cunning Gandhi, an assertive Gandhi that emerged in South Africa. Right? So there's, there's this one story of Gandhi's arrival which kind of demonstrates this. Within a matter of his arrival in Durban, Gandhi, one of the sources said, stalked out of the, a courtroom after a presiding judge asked him to remove his black turban. When the event was reported in the Natal advertiser, Gandhi quickly dispatched a written response, uh, explaining that donning the headgear justi was justified because it was a sartorial practice of showing respect. The late letter was published a mere four days after Gandhi had arrived in South, South Africa, and it shines a light on the South African Gandhi as a political entrepreneur, as a young Indian professional and provo provocateur nationalist who was hungry for public contention. The following anecdote invokes the now ubiquitous tale of Gandhi's ejection from a first class train compartment after a white passenger objected to the presence of a coolie in the car. So Gandhi protested after being ejected uh, off the train and eventually, quote, raised enough of a commotion that he finally was allowed to reboard the same train from the same station the next night under the protection of the schoolmaster, uh, sorry, stationmaster occupying a first class berth. All right, so what we see here is far from being a cowardly or defeated subject, we see how the young Gandhi, as I call him in South Africa, already possessed an instinct for resistance and a capacity to assert himself in the racial, racialized frontier polity of 19, late 19th century South Africa. Studies of the South African Gandhi reveal that his desire to challenge racist inequities of empire was coextensive with an enterprise that sought to identify ethical practices of daily life which he viewed as being vital to the durable attainment of social and political justice. Gandhi understood that the possession of moral character was a condition that had to be fulfilled if the Indians deemed themselves worthy of justice in the British Empire. Possessing and displaying such forms of character were crucial to Indian citizenship claims and therefore Gandhi uh, often drew attention to them as a spokesman for South African Indians, particularly those who were free uh, and not indentured to the sugar estate. So there's, there's a different difference here in terms of the constituencies that I'm talking about in this. This is basically drawn from uh, an article that I finish it's coming out in the next year. What remains to be explored more fully uh, in discussions of the South African Gandhi and the cultivation of character among Indians in the diaspora is the emphasis that Gandhi lent to the development of bodily strength as an enterprise that cultivated moral fortitude and character. So in the book, I acknowledge how 
Such forms of embodied disciplines included experiments in celibacy, fasting, dietary restraint, and physical labor as a means to counter the colonial attack on Indian masculinity through the voluntary imposition of a regime of self-control and discipline of the body. I discussed that in the first chapter. Physical exercise in the Gandhian idiom, for example, included agricultural and uh, manual labor. This is something that I also discuss in the first chapter. Uh, walking, yoga, pranayama, breathing, which together stimulated control over the senses. Such somatic control was indispensable to being able to wield soul force as a political, in the political field and simultaneously uphold the ethical ideals of Satyagraha. According to Gandhi, Indian men would obtain true self, self true swaraj, sorry, by pursuing physical routines on a daily basis, not only because they would afford the practitioner with physical and mental mastery, the iterative and meditative cadence of these routines would also reveal the path towards ethical conduct. So far from being a, far from consisting of a program that was merely inwardly looking or contemplative, Gandhi's physical regimen coupled together Indian masculinity and bodily strength because it required that his ideal male subject continuous, continuously meet the physical demands of Satyagraha. So in conceiving the link between the male body and political resistance in this fashion, Gandhi placed them in an evolving relationship with the acquisition of embodied force. One, as he put it tersely, <coughs> manliness consists in struggle. So, in chapter one of the book, I talk about how many of these physical practices were an important part of Gandhi's uh, pedagogy. So on the various ashrams and, and in some ways the main education institution in Ahmedabad, Gujarat, Vidyapit, he devised uh, a, a curriculum of study. And in addition to academic um, uh, subjects of study like history and sociology, languages was an important part physical training was also an important part. Two dimensions, like I mentioned, manual labor, but also drill and various forms of exercise. So in 1891, Gandhi wrote in The Vegetarian, quote, it must be admitted at the outset that Hindus are, as a rule, notoriously weak, end quote. The circulation of the British idea uh, of the effete Hindu male similar to this, catalyzed a significant reaction from Indian nationalists in late 19th century, in, sorry, late 19th and early 20th century India, and Gandhi was certainly a part of this reaction. Hind Swaraj, uh, uh, in Hind Swaraj, Gandhi responded by identifying modern European civil civilization itself as the cause of physical weakness and moral dege degeneracy among Indian men. The introduction of modern civilization in India had, quote, emasculated Indian men in particular. For Gandhi, the state of tacit peace provided by British treaties and protection meant that Indians possess no direct experience with armed conflict and violence any longer. Before British colonization, quote, Bills and Bindaris attacked and attempted to loot settled agricultural communities. Indian men in the plains, caste Hindus in particular, fought such dacoits, as he called them. Under the military protection of Pax Britannica, these marauders were no longer a threat. The British protected their colonial territories with a modern military force, thus guaranteeing the physical welfare of their subjects. Such protection was, quote, unmanly, and because of it, Indian men had become, quote, emasculated and cowardly, ultimately effeminate, end quote, in Gandhi's judgment. So if Indian men had become unmanly and effeminate, one wonders how Gandhi viewed the moral state of Indian women, women which is an important uh, part of his vision for what to do about the so-called uh, effeminate Hindu man. So strikingly, women possessed the moral fiber that Indian men did not, according to Gandhi. In his view, Indian women were par excellence courageous and brave, though not, not heroic in a superficial sense. Women were historically exemplars of self-sacrifice self and suffering, as attested in Indian mythology. Sita and Draupadi are two examples that he draws upon in his writing. 
For this reason, Indian men were Gandhi's primary concern and the targets of his project of reform. And while Indian men did indeed acquire courage, Gandhi also understood the bravery and fearlessness emanated from possessing a capacity for suffering. It followed, therefore, that the transformation of the Indian man required that, quote, the body is trained to suffer, end quote. Gandhi prevailed as a leader um, in the Indi uh, of the Indians of Durban during the Anglo-Boer War, war uh, uh, which began in 1899. Members of the Boer community fought a guerrilla war against the British to retain control over their republics in South Africa. So, just to a qualifier, I'm using the term Boer here. That's what the sources are using. Um, they're referring to Afrikaners, basically, but they're using this term Boer. Uh, during the war, uh, Gandhi and in other Indian males formed the Indian Ambulance Corps and served the British Army, quote, without pay, end quote. Service to the British not only demonstrated the loyalty of South African Indians to the empire in Gandhi's view, the exposure of the corps to the discomforts of war would also afford Indians with much needed, needed physical capacity. Deploying the Indians to the heart of the war was indispensable for Gandhi's quest to recuperate the courage of the Hindu male. The experience of transporting wounded British officers and soldiers in the thick of armed conflict was germane for, Gandhi, for the Gandhian project because of the new and indeed character building physical constraints it imposed on Indian volunteers. The services of the Corps were required at all times of the day and night under harrowing physical conditions, which meant that the volunteers ate, drank, and slept regularly. So here's a kind of um, a vignette from part of the war. During the bloody battle in Colenso, which is also in Natal, they shifted the wounded at night and were required to dismantle their camp immediately um, afterward and march to another part of Natal, Chaivali, from where they would take a, a train to Estercourt. Suffice it to say, there was little time for any rest or to recover from the night on that occasion. The natural environment in which the ambulance corps worked also posed severe challenges to the Indians. The Times of India noted that during the march to Chaivali station, it was an extremely hot day for marching. This portion of Natal is treeless and as well as, as well waterless." End quote. When they arrived at the station, the tired, hungry, and thirsty Indian volunteers had to spend the night as best as they could on the open veld, right, the elevated grasslands. Because the train could not transport both the Indian and the European ambulance volunteers to Estacol, they sent the Europeans first. The Indian volunteers endured the night and and brought dirty water from a pool about half a mile from the station, cooked rice, and consumed what was regarded as an excellent repast under the circumstances. However, because of the passing of General Buller's entire cavalry near the station that night, the noise that ensued, the men had very little rest. The next day, the men were, close, packed, were closely packed in the trunks, in trucks and after five hours of waiting, were transported to Estacourt by train. So they were put in the trucks, trucks, the trucks were put on the train, and the trains uh, went to Estacourt. There they were met with a violent storm that exposed them to sun and wind without shelter. They were temporarily disbanded, however, on Jan January 7th, reformed, this time under somewhat better auspices, in that the 900 odd bearers were provided with tents. The volunteers spent a fortnight undergoing rigorous training before they resumed their work in transporting the wounded. Such training entailed drilling the men and their leaders, which consisted in teaching the bearers how to lift the wounded, to place and carry them on stretchers. In addition, the bearers were given long distance, were, the bearers were taken long distances over extremely rugged ground, and all this training was found to be of inestimable, valuable, and none too strict. The Corps was more or less fitted for military discipline, as Gandhi noted, and therefore did not find it difficult. When they received their orders in the middle of the night to decamp so that they could take a train at 6 o'clock in the morning for Frere, there was no hesitation. 
So these kinds of hardships were painstakingly uh, documented by Gandhi and later recounted for multiple audiences, uh, which included British officials as well as Indians. The following speech that Gandhi gave in Calcutta in 1902 stressed that popular mobilization among Indian men needed to be guided by an imperative that braided together truth-seeking, the political efficacy of love, and the attainment of robust physical capacity as well. The Indians in South Africa readily volunteered for the war, according to Gandhi, because they, quote, claimed the privileges of British subjects, end quote. Gandhi characterized the work of the Indian Ambulance Corps as service that took place in the thick of sanguinary struggle, end quote, which rendered a vivid uh, portrait of the Indian middle class's deep sacrifice and capacity for great physical discomfort. The entire experience with the Boer War affirmed several virtues among Indians for Gandhi. Their tireless service to the British Army demonstrated that they prevailed under trying circumstances and with a measure of courage that was unmatched because the volunteers had to, quote, work under fire, just as the British soldiers did, end quote. It is important to note that Gandhi's invocation here does not suggest a capitulation or lapse on Gandhi's part towards his commitment to nonviolence. On the contrary, it was the ethos of physical and spiritual sacrifice that the war demanded of Indian men which Gandhi embraced. The Indians performed their task boldly. However, it was not a, quote, thirst for blood, end quote, that led them into the war. They entered the fray because, quote, like Arjun, they, were, they went to the battlefield because it was their duty. For Gandhi, the significance of the South African Indians' experience with the Boer War was that it illustrated that the volunteers met the disciplinary strategies disciplinary challenges of war with valor. Moreover, the performance of the volunteer corps in the war restored and affirmed Indian masculinity itself because it challenged the sedimented colonial view that Indian men were irrevocably effete, effeminate, and weak. After all, quote, Gandhi said, quote, the average Englishman believed that the Indian was a coward, incapable of taking risks, end quote. Gandhi remarked in his autobiography, from the outset, when South African Indians debated the wisdom of serving the British Army, Gandhi understood that the character of the Indian male was at stake. He warned them not to vacillate, or even worse, ally, try to ally themselves with whom they expected to prevail. He noted, quote, it would only be a sign of our effeminacy. It would be foolhardy if their decision was based on mere speculation on the outcome of the war because a man about to join a war cannot advance such an argument without forfeiting his manhood." End quote. The exemplary conduct of the Indian Ambulance Corps affirmed the manhood of the South African Indian, and Gandhi claimed this accomplishment publicly. He underscored the co that the Corps provided the British with an answer, which confirmed the falseness of the, quote, off-repeated charge in the colony that if there was a war, the Indians would scuttle away like rabbits, end quote. Okay, so what I want to do in the, in the last few minutes here of my talk is talk a little bit about arms, tra about arms training and conclude, and then we can um, have a discussion. Gandhi's celebrated doctrine of deploying love against one's political adversaries depended on the transformation of the Indian male, as I've already discussed. For Gandhi, for Gandhi, it was the discomfort of everyday army life, rigorous training, and threat of death that would reinvigorate Indian men. In this final illustration of my talk, I, I explore how Gandhi coupled together the recuperation of masculinity with arms training when the Indian Ambulance Corps was mobilized for service to the British Army. That British colonialism was deeply implicated in the, in the emasculation of Indian men because the colony the colonial army provided protection and thus disarmed Indian men from predatory decoys is a seminal belief um, that Gandhi held. So it undergirds his enterprise of securing arms training for members of the ambulance corps. Perhaps ironically, possessing knowledge in the use of arms was, signi was of si significant pedagogical value to Gandhi. When the Anglo-Boer War began, Gandhi wrote to the colonial secretary in which he flatly informed and therefore subtly accused the secretary that 
We Indians do not know how to handle arms. It's not our fault, and perhaps, perhaps it's our misfortune that we cannot." End quote. In the course of a campaign of letters and telegrams that followed, Gandhi placed a significant emphasis not, on, not only on the Indian's willingness to serve the British, but also on the urgency that the Indians be deployed on the battlefield. Those are his Turk words uh, in particular. The issue of receiving arms training and being deployed to the war front was not put to rest by Gandhi, and he insisted on it in many of the exchanges with the state. In 1906, Chief Bambata led 12 members of the Zulu community in Natal to resist paying a poll tax that the colonial government sought to impose. As in the Boer War before, Gandhi recognized that the conflict was an opportunity for the Indians to serve the British forces as stretcher bearers. He lobbied the government to mobilize members of the Corps, and for this purpose, he agitated to have the Corps receive arms training. He insisted that they serve as close to the war front as possible. Gandhi's proposal was met with ridicule by the whites of Natal, who judged the Indian men too cowardly to contribute to a citizen militia. The letter that was published in the Natal advertiser mocked the idea that the Indians could serve on the front line. The author sarcastically suggested that the Indians should indeed be enlisted and immediately dispatched to the front line. So, quote, they may not run away, end quote, if they are to be involved in the war effort at all. Gandhi countered sharply and cunningly by agreeing with the letter writer and pressing his own cause to have the Indians fully tra trained. If they be cowardly, they will serve, they would deserve the fate that will overtake them. However, if they be brave, nothing can be better for brave men than to be in the front line. Approximately two months after the Natal Indian Congress made its offer on behalf of the Indians, the government permitted the formation of the Stretcher Bearer Corps on, ex on an experimental basis consisting of 20 stretcher bearers. Though Gandhi found the number of armed Indians serving at the front to be a flea bite, as he called it, he celebrated the move because he expected that these 20 men would be provided with arms as part of, of an amendment to the Far Firearms Act, which legally disallowed Indians to be to receive military, military training, training in arms. Gandhi predicted that the state's decision to allow the Corps to be mobilized held <coughs> great promise, promise for the Indians if they came successfully through the ordeal. He speculated that they might be made into a permanent part of the militia that was forming among the Brit white British of Natal. So it seems to be a little bit of a paradox here that we find Gandhi, a figure who is so strongly associated with the project of political nonviolence, advocating so vociferously for the Indians' deep involvement with war, and urgently advocating for Indian men to receive arms training. For all of Gandhi's enthrallment with violence, war, and weapons that we've encountered so far, it's important to recall that once again Gandhi's chief concern was to have Indian men undertake these forms of technical training for the purpose of acquiring tactical knowledge in the field of political confrontation, and equally important, emerge from the experience as, a, as, agents, as an agent who was fearless. These forms of knowledge and, the cur and courage were central to his nonviolent project, and it was crucial for Gandhi's masculine satyagrahi to intimately understand physical force in order to be able to bear it, the injuries it could cause, and of course, death. In this context, one has to ask, you know, to whom was this military training um, directed? What was its virtue and who would make up the permanent volunteer force that Gandhi envisioned? So Gandhi's primary concern was to convince Indian traders to take an interest while also assuage their fears of war and military tra training. In the Indian opinion, he noted that there was very little risk of participating in, in such a force because wars are not fought all the time. Moreover, a volunteer could keep in good health because the yearly military training that he would receive would keep his body in good trim. More important, he would be a civilian soldier who was much respected by the public, and this would surely deliver to the Indians, quote, some political advantage as well, end quote. Members of the com training community ought to take up, make up the force as a matter of duty, according to Gandhi, and each shop should volunteer at least one man, and the entrainment that he received would augment his physical strength and energy. Despite the fact that Gandhi endorsed a venture that would instruct Indian men in the techniques of violence and war, 
Experience on the front line was in fact part of the larger project of physical and moral restoration of the Indian man, one that would later become central to his project of Satyagraha in South Africa. The Indian volunteers served for six weeks after which they were disbanded. Much of their time involved attending to members of the Zulus who were not directly involved in the rebellion, but who were injured because the British had flogged them on the suspicion that they were collaborators. When the Natal Indian Congress honored the members of the Bearer Corps, Gandhi reiterated his call that Indians be given arms training. He counseled the Congress to strive to establish a permanent corps by appealing to the state and organizing physical training within the community so that they would qualify for the militia. Shortly afterward, he made his appeal directly to Colonel Heisler, who is the principal medical officer of the Natal militia. In his letter to Heisler, Gandhi argued that the skillful service of the stretcher bearer confirmed that Indians recognized their responsibility as settlers in Natal, and thus the government should, quote, utilize Indians as a permanent portion of the Natal militia, and that they should, be, that, that they should all be armed for self-protection. So the centrality of the reformed and uh, uh, masculine body uh, for Gandhi's movement in South Africa was consequential for the growth of the Satyagraha movement um, in India. Though his political activities were known after he arrived in 1915, the political terrain that Gandhi encountered in India was different and more complex. He had to build a following in India among competing nationalist movements and political factions in Gujarat where he based his movement. Equally important, he had to build a popular movement among Indians who lacked discipline, who were physically weak or morally corrupt, corrupt in his view. In these years, we see Gandhi turn to military training and the use of arms as a panacea to reform the effeminate Indian subject, the male subject. In various ways, uh, experience on the war front was germane to Gandhi's project to create manly activist cadres who were disciplined, fearless, and morally grounded. Gandhi gained important insights from the Boer War, particularly when he turned his gaze toward the resistant Boer community itself. He stated that however the Boers uh, may quarrel among themselves, their liberty is so dear to them that when it is in danger, all get ready to fight as one man." End quote. Gandhi diagnosed that the Boer community's Calvinist faith aided their efforts to resist the British because it demanded that they commit themselves to acts of suffering and sacrifice, which consequently propelled this, quote, fighting nation to victory, end quote. The combination of military conflict, which required regiment control with the Boer community, in addition to a religiously inscribed commitment to suffering, unified the Boer community, according to Gandhi. It fueled their courage to undertake a war against superior forces. The cases of the Boers was instructive for Gandhi as he crafted his methods to challenge the British Empire because, according to him, quote, every Boer was a good fighter, end quote. Fighters of this kind were eminently worthy of emulation and they were precisely the kind which Gandhi sought to make of Indian men, warriors, as he called them, that were physically trained and morally anchored and fearless of their adversaries. Thank you.